John chapter 6, we'll begin reading in verse number 3. The Bible says, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to the house of God, this oasis of life. Lord, where we can leave our troubles and our cares outside and come in for a few minutes and focus upon what really matters. And Lord, we're certainly glad for the hope of heaven and eternity, but we bless you for an abundant life here. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you would open our eyes to thy truth. I pray that you would elevate us spiritually. I pray that, Lord, you do a work in our hearts and in our lives, that, Lord, when we leave this place, others would take note that we've been with Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be a lot better than what has become acceptable for modern-day Christianity. Help us, Lord, not to fall in line with a creed, but help us, Lord, to fall in line with Christ. Now, Father, I pray if there's anybody amongst us unsaved, today would be the day of their salvation. But I pray for the saved today, Lord, that you'd help us to be the very best that we can be. There are certainly souls in the balance, and there are souls depending on us having revival. Bless as only you can. We'll thank you for it. Certainly touch Miss Mary. Lord, we pray for Brother Bobby. You'd help him. We pray for the Littles and the Hensleys, you would touch them. We also pray for Brother Doug, you would touch him and help him. Be with others that are providentially hindered, couldn't be here today. Meet every need of every heart, and we'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Of course, this is the popular story where Jesus takes five loaves and two fishes, and he feeds 5,000 men not counting the women and the children. Many believe there was upwards of 15,000, 20,000 people there. Notice that one of the disciples said that, you know, 200 penny worth of bread is not enough for them to eat a little. But if you study the text, they ate as much as they would, Brother Bob. They were full. And then the lad took up 12 baskets and went home with 12 baskets full. I mean, what a God, what a miracle, what a wonderful thing. But I want you to notice a few things as a way of introduction. First, we see the quandary in verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. We find in verse uh, 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 number 2 that it was a great multitude. So here comes a great multitude. There's a quandary. You have to understand, Jesus took his disciples up into a mountain to pray. He took them up there to teach them some things, and a great multitude uh, follows. Uh, there wasn't a White Castle Brother Ed around where they could get some food. Uh, there wasn't uh, a, a, a grocery store anywhere close. Uh, uh, all they had was rocks and stones, a little bit of grass, uh, and a multitude. Uh, this is a big problem. Uh, but can I help you with something today? Uh, what are big problems for you and I are not big problems for the Lord. Uh, uh, the Lord uh, certainly is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Uh, he is not limited, uh, and He is well able to take care of you and I. We find the quandary. Now notice the question. Again in verse number 5, he says this, uh, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, Jesus never asked the question because he didn't know the answer. We find that verse 6. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus always asked a question so that you and I would realize we don't know the answer. Hmm? 
He always has answers because he is the answer. Uh, we see the quandary. We see the question. Now notice the qualm. Look in verse number 9. There is a lad here, this is Andrew speaking, which had five barley loaves and two fishes. Colon. Or is it a semicolon? Colon. Now, he should have said right then, what a blessing. But he didn't. Notice what he says, but what are they among so many? Mm -hmm. Can I say that he's full of doubt? Now, don't look down on Andrew. You and I would be the same way. Lord, all we got is five loaves and two fishes. Look at his crowd. Uh but can I say that his doubted, he doubted and that discounted what the Lord could do? Because when you and I doubt, we are discounting the Lord's great hand. Our faith turns to fear. And without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. Now, I've got written in the flyleaf of my Bible, and if you've ever heard that message that I've ever preached on when Jesus touches your bread... It's in there. You'll find that Philip, had, he lacked faith. You'll find Andrew had a little bit of faith. You'll find the lad, he had lending faith. And you find the Lord, he's the author and finisher of faith. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm interested in what's going on in verse number 9. There's five loaves and two fishes. And he says, but what are they among so many? What he is saying to the Lord is the five loaves... And the two fishes are insignificant considering what we're faced with. But can I uh, remind you this morning that God uses insignificant things. Can I say that he used Moses' staff to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? Uh, can I say that he used Aaron's rod uh, uh, to announce who the, the Levitical priest line would be? Uh, he used David's sling to bring down a nation uh, and to bring down an, uh, a, a giant and a nation. Uh, he used Gideon's lamp and pitcher to defeat a great mighty army. Uh, he used the river of Jordan in Naaman's life to heal his leprosy. Uh, he specializes in using insignificant things. Uh, he used a window in Daniel's life. Uh, uh, to reveal who God was. Uh, 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 can I say that he used old clouts and rotten rags in Jeremiah's life uh, uh, to get him out of a dungeon? Uh, hey, he used Jacob's well uh, uh, to introduce a woman at the well uh, uh, to the saving hand of God's grace. Uh, hey, can I say that he used the jawbone of an ass to whip a thousand Philistines? Uh, hey, he used Bethlehem's manger uh, uh, to usher in the king of glory. Uh, hey, can I say he used the widow's cruise of oil uh, uh, that stayed all the days of her life. Uh, hey, can I use the, he used the thorn in Paul's life uh, uh, to show him that God's grace is sufficient. Uh, hey, he used a borrowed donkey uh, uh, to enter into Jerusalem in. Uh, hey, he used the small, insignificant Isle of Patmos uh, uh, to give John the revelation for the churches. Uh, God uses insignificant things. Uh, how to preach for a little while this morning on this thought. How to become insignificant. See, if God uses insignificant things, we ought to be insignificant. Now, let me caution you. Being insignificant does not be, mean being worthless. The devil tries to convince every one of us that we are worthless, that we are not worth the blood of the Lord Jesus, uh, that we are not worth saving, uh, that we are not worth anything. Uh, well, the devil may not think we're worth much, uh, but the Lord Jesus said when he come back in Malachi chapter 4, he's coming back to make up his jewels. Uh, he looks at us as precious. Uh, hey, uh, he looks at us and says Calvary was worth it. Uh, he looks at uh, how he was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him uh, and the travail of his soul uh, was worth it uh, because he brings many sons unto glory uh, and you and I uh, are worth it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, don't mix insignificance with worthlessness. 
Because everybody says, well, I ain't worth the Lord Jesus. Get over that. You've been robed in His righteousness. You've been placed on the roll of the Lamb's book of life. Your conversation and citizenship is in heaven. You have been made a joint heir to the throne of Christ. Uh, you are not a second class citizen. The God of glory is your heavenly Father uh, and He loves you beyond what you know what love is uh, and you are something to Him. Uh, but in order for us to be used of Him, we've got to become insignificant. So how do we become insignificant? Well, first of all, insignificance comes with waning in perspective. Most of us think a little bit more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And while you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to, you become useless to God. He can't use you because you're not insignificant. You've got to wane in that perspective, or in other words, uh, lose sight of that perspective. Listen to what the Bible says. John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man born of woman. John the Baptist said this, He must increase, but I must decrease, in John 3.30. Uh, uh, Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, my life verse, uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, uh, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Uh, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me uh, and gave himself for me. Uh, in a nutshell, Paul says, not I, but Christ. Uh, uh, listen, uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 17, uh, uh, the prophet Samuel spoke to Saul, uh, and this is all the king of Israel. Israel, this is what he said. Uh, and Samuel said, uh, When thou wast little in thine own sight, uh, wast thou made head of the tribes of Israel, uh, and the Lord anointed thee king of Israel. Amen. While Saul was little in his own sight, God used him. When he became full of conceit, God replaced him. We've got a wane in perspective. We need to realize that in our own strength we are nothing. But through His strength there's nothing we can't do. We've got to depend upon God in order to become insignificant. The reason we don't have revival, the reason so many Christians' lives are in a mess, the reason nobody has joy is people are trying to live their life their own way. And you're doing it void of God. But when you become insignificant you realize I, His breath is in my hand. I can't take another step without Him. I need Him more than I need anything else. When He becomes your all in all, then business starts picking up, friends. Uh, insignificance comes with a waning in perspective, but it also becomes with being workable. There are some people so rigid, even God can't use them. Hmm? I've heard a lot of people say, Well, preacher, I'm willing to do this as long as I can do it this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And you say, Preacher, what do you tell him? I said, Thank you, go on down the road. Hmm. A servant of the Lord must come to the Lord with a blank piece of paper and say, Here, Lord, you fill out the details. You've got to become workable. You must be approachable. There are some people you can't approach them hmm, because their ego's in the way. Hmm. You've got to be workable. You've got to be approachable. Then you've got to be agreeable. Hmm? Brother Doug and I was talking about that a little bit before church this morning. <laughs> there are some things what we must agree on, and if folks aren't going to agree on them, then they just got to go on their way. Uh, there, there's some things that there's no place for our opinions. You must be agreeable to God. You know how you are agreeable to God? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They went and got that donkey. The donkey didn't say, well, before I let the Lord ride on me, I want shoes that are gold-plated, and I want an easy path. I don't want you hitting no rocks. Uh, I, I certainly want uh, the Lord to go on a diet. I, I got a certain load that I'll carry. No, the donkey just did what donkeys do. Huh? The window Daniel used, he just threw it up and prayed out that window three times a day. The window didn't say, no, not today, Daniel. Nope. To be insignificant, you yield yourself to someone greater. 
and the one that is greater is the Lord. You must be approachable, you must be agreeable, but you also must be available. Amen. See, when the Lord told him, go get that donkey, he knew right where that donkey was. And can I say, if you are not in your place, then the Lord can't use you. Right. You've got to be workable. You've got to wane in perspective, but being insignificant also comes with being watchful. You've got to be alert. Man. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be sober. Why? Your adversary is the devil walking about seeking whom he may, be, he may devour. You've got to be alert. You've got to be on guard. You've got to be listening for the Lord. Right. Hmm? Can I say the Lord is always speaking? In Isaiah 6, the Lord is not speaking to Isaiah. The Lord is speaking to the Lord. Now, if that blows your mind, the Lord is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're three separate entities, but they're one. And there's a conversation between the Lord and heaven. They said, whom shall we send and who will go for us? Now, they're not speaking to Isaiah. They're speaking one to another. But Isaiah was so tuned in because he just saw the Lord high and lifted up in the, in the, in the temple. And uh, Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, send me. He's alert. He's listening. He understands the Lord has something he wants done, and he says, Lord, I'll go, I'll do it. There are some people that only listen when they think it pertains to them. You've got to be alert. The Lord's always speaking. But so many of us have so much noise going on in our lives, we don't hear him. Mm. It's kind of like commercials. Anybody ever pay attention to commercials? I don't. We try to DVR everything so we can fast forward through the commercials. I hate them. Mm. Except the ones about the people that are turned into their parents. Those are funny. Huh? Guy in the elevator. You know? Those are funny. Huh? Because I know people just like those people. Those are funny. Huh? Well, see, we've got so many things going on in our lives, we don't hear it. the Lord speaking. Because let me help you something. He don't speak with a trumpet. He speaks with a still, small voice. Amen. And you've got to be alert to hear it. You've got to be watchful. Can I say, insignificance comes with being well. By being well, I mean being content. Satisfied with being insignificant. I don't need to be the biggest voice in the house. I don't need to be anything. I'm just glad that I get to go along for the ride with the Lord. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be content with that. Listen, not long ago, uh, I went to a camp meeting. I was not only invited to the camp meeting, I was one of the main guys in the camp meeting. My name was on the flyer they sent out to hundreds of churches. I didn't preach in the camp meeting. Now, I know some people got real upset over that. My name's on the flyer. I'm down here. I didn't get to preach. I hugged the preacher's neck because I told the preacher when I got there, you don't have to worry about preaching me, just mind the Lord. Huh? It wasn't about me preaching. It was about what that church needed. Are you listening? Let me put it in perspective. Being content with being insignificant is like this. Everybody knows what a door is? Everybody knows what a door handle is? Everybody sees a door, everybody sees a door handle. You touch the door, you touch the door handle. But inside the door handle, there's a mechanism. Nobody ever sees the mechanism. Without the mechanism, the door handle doesn't work and the door don't open. The mechanism is insignificant. Nobody sees it. But without it, nothing happens. Being content is being the mechanism. I don't need to be seen. 
I don't need to get all the glory and get the paint job every now and then. I don't need to uh, uh, be polished as the door handle every now and then. I don't need all that. I just need to be insignificant. Uh, and when the Lord calls my name, uh, if He chooses to use me to open a door for somebody else, hallelujah. If He chooses uh, for me to just stay there and keep the door shut, hallelujah. Just be content where God has placed you, my dear friends. Amen. That's being insignificant. Uh, humility is not being a welcome mat and letting everybody walk on you and say woe is me no humility is knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and abiding therein hmm? just being content with how God's made you uh, now brother Jeff Davis is here God made him a whole lot taller than me now I could sit in here and suck my thumb and say boy if I was as tall as him I could play college basketball and blah 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 blah, blah. but that's not how God made me. God made me me. Huh? And God made him him. I'm glad for him, and I'm glad for me. That's why you look at You don't look at boy and start looking around trying to be something you're not. Be what God made you. and be. God loves you just the way you are, and he made you just the way you are. Be content with that. Huh? Don't be trying to step out of the lane God's got you in. Hmm? Don't try and be a handle when you're a mechanism. Now, you might be a handle. Be a handle. Don't be a mechanism. It's very simple. It amazes me how everybody's always wanting to be something they're not. Or everybody's always wanting to sign up for something they're not. Or they're looking for a way to get out of where they are. God's got you right where He's got you because He wants you where He's got you. So just be what you are and be content therein. Mm -mm. It's called being well. People are always trying to get out of what they are. They're not well, they're ill. If you're not careful, you'll get bitter because you're not what you think you ought to be. Mm -mm. Listen. If you're going to be insignificant, you've got to be willing. Now that sounds simple, but that's very hard. Can I say you've got to be willing to abide in a brook? And let all the rough edges get worn off of you so one day the shepherd can come by and pull you out and put you in his shepherd's bag with four more just like you because he's going to take on a giant. I don't know how much water went over them five smooth stones, but it didn't happen in a day. You just got to be willing to be where you're, where you're supposed to be till the shepherd comes by and gets you. Hmm? You got to be willing to lift up the man of God's arms till the blood drains from your arms and you don't know how you're going to lift them up any longer and still lift them up until the victory's won like Aaron and Hur did. Amen. Moses got all the glory, but it was Aaron and Hur who lifted up his arms that brought the victory. Hmm? You got a willing to pray and believe when nobody else will. It's easy to pray when everybody's doing it. But when nobody does it, you still got to be willing to pray and believe. Huh? You got to be willing to stand in the gap even though there are others who are more qualified. Just stand in the gap. Make up the hedge. Hmm? You just got to be willing. You got to be willing to walk through an open door and not know what's ahead. Hmm? We just talked about this when we met yesterday. Everybody wants to sign up when you see the end. Hmm? Nobody wants to stand, you know, sign up when you take a step and you don't know where you're going. Amen. Hmm. Uh, and it's Christ and Caribbean. Everybody wants all the answers. We don't even know what the questions are yet. All we know is God said, go. And we're going. That's all we know. Now the rest is all up to God. Amen. The problem with a lot of people is they can't handle that. I'm perfectly content with that. Because if, if it's all up to me, I'm, I'm not sleeping at night. I got ulcers, but it's not up to me. Just let God do it. I learned a long time ago, when I give it to God, <laughs> life's a lot better for me. Hmm? But you just got to be willing to go through doors not knowing what's ahead. Can I say this? You got to be willing to become insignificant without seeking recognition. 
A lot of people sign on the dotted line if they're going to get some esteem out of it. If people are going to recognize them, people are going to notice them, people are going to pump them up, people are going to say, oh, look at you, look at you, look at you. Hmm? You've got to be insignificant without seeking the recognition. Because a well done, thou good and faithful servant, when we get to glory, is worth a whole lot more than a pat on the back here. Hmm? Uh, you've got to be willing to please the Lord while you're facing opposition. Because if you're going to live for the Lord, you will face opposition. Not everybody's going to understand. Not everybody's going to agree. Not everybody's going to think that you're where you're supposed to be. Hmm? I'll never forget, 100 years ago, uh, I've been preaching for just a, a couple years, it amazed me how every pastor knew what the will of God was for my life. Some told me I'd be a pastor. Many told me I'd be an evangelist. Many told me I'd be doing this, and I'd be doing that, and I'd be doing this. There was only one problem. God hadn't told me. I used to frustrate Brother Josh. I used to frustrate them to no end. they say, well, what's God called you to do? I said, preach. Yeah, but in what ministry? I said, he hadn't told me yet. I was preaching, Brother Doug, nine years before I knew God wanted me to pastor. Nine years. And God called me to pastor. I can take you and show you the verse that he gave me when he called me to pastor. Six months later, I started pastoring. Now, since then, I've had many people say, well, you're going to be an evangelist. It's amazing. God hadn't told me that. I'm still pastoring. A mm. little late to start something else. I'll be 60 this year. I know I don't look it, but I will be. And I feel about 80 right now. Huh? You say, what are you trying to say? People are always going to have an opinion what the will of God should be for your life. The only one that knows is God in you. Mm. And so you've got to be willing to face that opposition. A lot of people I know are willing to get to glory. But Brother Sammy, a lot of people don't want to fight. Mm. I know pastors that quit the ministry. I've known pastors that have quit the ministry in the last year because they didn't want to face opposition. Let me help you something. If you don't want to face opposition, get out of the ministry. If you don't want to face opposition, quit being a Christian. Because you have an enemy called the devil. And you have a world right now that is woke, and you are the enemy. Hmm? You have uh, the flesh, which doesn't like opposition. Being insignificant just means following God's will and face the opposition. Listen. A lot of people are willing to become worthless. You know what we do with worthless things? We send them to scrap yards. Brother Clint, God don't have a scrap yard. He's the potter and we're the clay. And even when we get broken and we are subject to get broken, we're subject to fall under pressure. He just remolds us and reshapes us. He don't send us to scrap yards. Huh? He then takes us under his tender care. And he does a work on our life. And Brother Sammy, I've learned this. I've seen people who have cracked under pressure and blown it. But then I've seen God put his hand on them. And I've seen God do a work in their life. And you know what I find? After he's done the work on them, they become far better than they ever were in the first place. Because they appreciate his touch a whole lot more. And can I say, you're not worthless. Don't be willing to become worthless. You're not worthless to God. Just be willing to become insignificant. Be willing to love to a fault. Can I say it's easy to love people that are lovable? And it's real easy to love people who love you. But you know what it is to be a Christian? You love people who are against you. You know one of the beauties of America that this generation has forgot? The Bill of Rights affords us as Americans to have our own opinions. 
And being an American, it don't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, you have that right in America. But Americans have lost their mind. If you're not what they are, then you're the enemy. That's not what America was founded on. America was founded on you have a free-thinking brain and you can be what you desire to be. As long as you don't break the law. But even now in America, you can break the law and get away with it if you fall on a certain side. But see, today, you, they want to make enemies of somebody who don't think like that. That's what made America great, is when you got somebody who thought this way and somebody who thought this way, and they began to share ideals, and they came out with a great way. Sir. Amen. But can I say, as a Christian, we are to love people who don't think like we think, right. who don't act like we like act, right. who don't look like we look. We're to love them anyway. Because if we show them the love of Christ, they may come to know Him. Even folks that know Him and treat us poorly were to love them. The night that Judas came to betray Jesus, Jesus kissed him on the cheek. Or I'm sorry, Judas kissed him on the cheek and Jesus called him friend. Jesus could have smote him on his way to him. But he loved him to a fault. And he loved you to a fault. And we're to love others to a fault. Can I help you? Can I say, being insignificant means to show compassion to people that don't deserve it. Being a Christian means being a bigger person. That when people use you despitefully, you don't complain and mumble and all that. You pray for them and you love them and you thank God that you were in a position where they could use you despitefully. So I've had people take things from me. You ought to thank God you had something worth taking. I know a lot of people don't have anything worth taking. And by the way, they probably needed it worse than you in the first place. And if you have the right attitude, God will bless you abundantly for it anyway. Huh? I'm just trying to help you. We've got in our mindset that being a Christian is following a set of rules. Hogwash. Being a Christian is to be like Jesus. Huh? We are to become broken bread and poured out wine for other people. And when we're like Him, we may be insignificant, but he's taken note. God help us. To realize the way up in God's economy is down. The way forward is surrender. The way to please is for us to become insignificant. Because when you're willing to be the mechanism, or the window, or the donkey, or the jawbone, or the staff, or the rod, or the Red Sea, or the Jordan River, or anything else that nobody else deems worth using. But God says, you know what, I need that right there for this cause. And if God ever chooses to use you for anything, there's nothing greater in your life. And He won't use you as long as you're trying to get the credit for it. Become insignificant and look and see if God doesn't use you to impact somebody else's life. And isn't that what we're supposed to be as Christians anyway? We're supposed to impact others. Let me ask you a question today. Are you insignificant? You can be. Why don't you ask God to help you become insignificant for His glory and see what He does in your life. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While well, he's coming, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, you know my heart. I wanted to preach something else today. Lord, you gave it to me Wednesday. But Lord, last night in my study, you gave me this thought. And Lord, we're thankful for it. God, I just want to be insignificant. Whatever you say, Lord, help me to do it. 
Lord, it's hard to battle the flesh to become insignificant. It's hard to suppress our ego and our conceits and yield to the Holy Spirit. But Lord, thank you for that nudge and that touch that causes us to want to please you. Now, Father, help your people. Lord, I know if they've sat under preaching for any length of time, they've, they've been taught the way to please God is to follow a bunch of rules. All rules do is make us regimented. The Holy Spirit writes the laws of God in our heart. Those are the ones that are hard to follow. So, Father, I pray you'd help your people to realize they're not worthless. But if they become insignificant, little in their own eyes, God, you can use them in a great way. Lord, we're faced with much opposition and we live in a wicked world. And Lord, you look around this world, we wonder if there's any hope. There is. And it's found in insignificance. God, send great revival these days. Save many souls. And may it start with your people realizing to be, they need to become insignificant for God's glory. And God do a great work. Bless this invitation now. Uh, Lord, I know it wasn't a salvation message, but if there's somebody here lost and you're dealing with them, I pray they'd come get saved. And God, I certainly pray for your people. Lord, bless them, help them, send revival. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.